My name is Alex Ifkovich. I'm the CIO for CDFIT, and we come cover a number of different companies in the packaging industry. Alex, so nice to have you. You know, one of my research areas uh, is application modernization and migration. So, you know, when I saw that you had gone through an IFS upgrade, I said, boy, it'd be great to have Alex on this. So thank you for joining me and I'm looking forward to this. Sounds like you had a very clean, very successful upgrade. Um, thank you, Vinny, for having me. So I'm going to explain a little bit first about the company so that you can understand where I'm coming from. CDFIT, we cover the CDF group, and we have two factories in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Our drum and pail division produces liners for 55-gallon drums and 5-gallon pails and various size containers using thermoforming blow molding. Our uh, flexible packaging division produces big IBC liners. That liner you see on the right-hand side is about 250 gallons. And we also produce bag and box liners, as does our quad pack division in Sweden. Our chair pack division 250 produces- gallon, 250 gallons would be how many pounds? I have no heavy. idea. <laughs> it's a lot. They're, they're big. You're, you're getting a forklift for that, Vinny. These, so are more, our, these are much more portable, right? The, the ones you're showing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these, these you put in your grocery shopping cart. Yeah. Um, so our, our cheer pack division produces spouted pouches like you see in the grocery store for, um, you know, baby food. They're super popular. And we do a lot of other stuff, too. The, uh, the Klondike Shake Frozen one was very popular for a while. Ketchup, just all sorts of things. And uh, we sell huge amount of these in the U.S. We have a, a very large market share. I wanted to show some of the outside vendor systems that tie into our IFS system. So our IFS system is the primary system of record. We're located on premises with servers in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, Cedar Bay, very good partner of ours, and they um, do all of our shop floor control stuff barcoding, material tracking. So this is scanning guns and receiving things into inventory, et cetera. And they also provide a connection from our SCADA system in terms of scrap and feed it directly in the IFS. So that's great. Um, Astra Canyon, we use an automated accounts payable system from them that uh, is amazing. It scans invoices coming in, automatically processes them. And my accounting people tells me it saves something like 80% of our time um, in a, to do accounts payable. Pagero does invoice delivery and tracking. So those are fed automatically from accounting. IFS Labs was a, a project where we did robotic material handling where the IFS system will actually call for more material to replenish our machines. And uh, Focus is something we started using fairly recently, and it's um, kind of a drag-and-drop budget analysis system um, that, you know, is end-user friendly. So rather than come to IT for reports, users are empowered to do that on their own. So it's something that's uh, working out quite well. And we feed all of the divisions that I mentioned in the previous slide. You know, Alex, this is relatively clean. Um, I started to see people ring, what I call it, ring fence, the core ERP functionality. And I know some companies that are up to 70, 80, 100 cloud applications that are on their ERP. So you've got it well contained. Yeah, I mean, if, if you have 70 or 80 applications, I, I really question what your system of record is because it sounds like you have various data spread all over the place, right? Yep. Okay, so... um. Let's get into the upgrade process. And first question is, why do we upgrade, right? I mean, it's disruptive. It's usually fairly expensive. And I don't know anyone that loves doing it, that's for sure. But, you know, regular upgrades are just part of living with software. And some of it's going to be political. Everyone has to negotiate with their management. What's going to be allowed? What's not? When can we do it? Um we, about 15 years ago, went to IFS, and we were way behind in a version of an older system called Glovia. And so we kind of said at the time, we don't want to fall behind like that again. So we agreed that we would have a regular upgrade schedule of every three years. And I think that works out really well, because I don't have to have a big 
negotiation about it. Everyone kind of understands that's going to happen. And now some of the new evergreen systems that I'll explain in a moment uh, make that even easier. You know, you know, Alex, uh, to some extent, you know, vendors love to use the word gardener, when I was a gardener, we coined it, uh, technical debt to embarrass buyers, to guilt buyers into doing upgrades. But honestly, they haven't made upgrades very easy. So, you know, I'm glad you've got a, some kind of a balance there, right? Where it's not, um, every, not every three months, um, it, it's at a reasonable balance. It's worked out quite well for us. I think the three-year approach has been uh, has been effective. It's it's often enough to keep us in good software without uh, you know killing the company every time. So this is a, a slide from IFS actually, um, and it shows the various versions of IFS back to 2015. We were originally on Apps Nine, that's the top line, and around 2019 2020 we went to Apps Ten, and they had upgrades kind of built into apps 10 where you went to different versions um, at the time of starting the upgrade we were on that update 19 that you see on the screen and the version that we built our upgrade in was that 22 r2 so that's where we did a lot of the work with scripting and stuff now in the meantime the 23 r1 version came out but it was decided with the help of ifs tech support that it made a lot more sense to just go ahead and upgrade to 22R1 and then upgrade that using the normal upgrade procedure and go to 23R, I'm sorry, 22R2 and then upgrade it using the normal upgrade procedure to 23R1. So that's what we did. So effectively on upgrade day, which was Thanksgiving day, this past Thanksgiving, we did the entire upgrade using the scripts and the conversion from the apps 10. And then we used the much simpler cloud version uplift procedure and went to that version. Um, actually, and 23R2 came out uh, almost the same week we went live, and I decided I wasn't taking that chance. So that would have been a little much. Um, it, it was kind of interesting. So this is now their new Evergreen support. And what they're saying is that we'll never have to do a major upgrade again. They're going to release these updates twice a year, every six months. It's going to include new functionality. It's going to include fixes and patches. Um, and we should never, ever have to do a major upgrade again. Now, I hope they're right, but I can't help but think Microsoft said the same thing about Windows 10, and as we all know, we're on Windows 11, so I, <laughs> you know. Well, it's it, it, good that they're aiming for minimizing the disruption, you know. Yes. Right, and one thing that was really good was, so now I've had the experience, because we, we did upgrade to 22R2, and the upgrade to 23R1 was was very fairly quick and easy. I mean, I think it took me maybe two hours, um, which is surprising, and it went very well. It didn't, you know, it, it was an easy upgrade compared to the, the major uplift, so I'd, any, I'd be thrilled if they could keep this up. You what? Any regression testing, nothing? Well, no, we did the testing ahead of time. I mean, I, I had a test environment where we did it, but I'm talking about actually on go live day, which is when things usually, you know, sometimes go south, that it, it just went very slick. Okay. Okay. So this is just coming up. This is my upgrade philosophy. I don't know that everyone's going to agree with me, but this is how I feel about things that you need to do. Um, first of all, one thing I see is that a lot of companies, when it comes to an upgrade like this, they like to form a committee and, and have a lot of meetings. And I, I think someone really has to be in charge of the product and own the upgrade because there's too many little decisions that are important, but they need to be made quickly. And um, you're just going to hang your upgrade up if everything has to wait for a meeting in the next committee meeting. And they're going to need to rely on key team members for technical pieces. I'm not saying they have to know everything about everything, but they have to have the authority to, to kind of get things done and moving without every little detail having to, to go to a meeting. They also need to insist that people communicate with them. So a lot of times my People that work for me will be talking to a vendor or something. And even if they're talking about stuff that I completely don't understand, I still want to be in on those emails to get a really good picture of what's going on. And now I get that in a really large organization that that may take a few multiple people, but then, then I, my feeling is it should be kind of divided by areas where maybe one person's handling the accounting upgrade and someone else the manufacturing. But either way, I think there has to be a champion and a sort of a team leader in each area. You know, I, I completely agree because 
upgrades, you have to freeze your users out for a while, right? And you want to minimize that. And, and you know, if somebody's um, neck is not on the block, God, you can have finger pointing and, you know, that free spirit can just grow. Right. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think part of the reason for the committees and stuff is um, to avoid having your neck on the block, right? If I'm in charge of the upgrade and it doesn't work, that's on me and I have to accept that. Whereas, you know, if we've got seven of us on the committee, then, well, you know, nobody could make a decision. But in the end, I think that your upgrade is going to go much better if you if someone does accept the responsibility. So let's talk about the cloud. Now, it's a little confusing in IFS nomenclature. So IFS Cloud is the name of their new version of the software, but it's also a hosting thing where they host in the cloud. So the IFS Cloud software can be hosted either on-prem, which is what we do on our premises, or you can host it in the IFS Cloud, and that's a choice you make. Um, there's been, you know, so much talk about the cloud and it's such a, a huge thing. And I'm not really convinced. I mean, it's still just servers that are hosting stuff. I think the software companies have loved it because basically it helps to sell annual software subscriptions versus owning the software, which is obviously advantageous to the software company to have that revenue stream. Um, depending on your, your structure and your IT team, it does have some advantages in that it moves server level support from internal to the vendor. So if you don't really need a full-time server person, then that's advantageous. And depending on the agreement you have with the company, you can move other levels of support, such as doing upgrades or day-to-day -day support. So it's really a matter of balancing the advantage of being up in the cloud in terms of staff levels with what you can do internally. Um, there's a disadvantage. This is a you know this is a conversation as you can imagine as an analyst. NetSuite was started in ninety seven, probably the first cloud ERP offering, and so I've seen debates around this for twenty five years now, right? Yeah. And the industry loves to get involved in multi tenancy conversations and all the architectural advantages of cloud, but yeah, but you're netting it out. You know, in the end, hey, tell me where the value is. Tell the monetary value is, right? And often that gets lost. And you know, now that we've entered the world where cloud is really hyperscalar cloud, you get into other issues that you know five years, 10 years ago we didn't think about. So it is uh it I agree with you. It's got to be a deliberate decision. You can't just get sucked into the hype. Look at the numbers. Um, there is a disadvantage in my world in that you lose the ability to access and interface with the data to some extent. So, for example, you know, you can't necessarily directly access the database. And some of the vendor programs I showed you earlier, that's how they work. So now they have to be rewritten to talk to the APIs. It can all be done, but it's a, it's a project. It's a thing. Um, so really, as we kind of just discussed, Vinny, the deciding factor to me is can I save money by going to the cloud or is there an advantage? Huge advantage to me, or um, you know, do we just stay on prem? And in our case, I, I really couldn't save, you know, get rid of any staff or save any money. So staying on prem made the most sense. Yeah, and it, it sounds like your servers and all that weren't completely. Uh, you, you know, you can depreciate them and not 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 be too penalized financially. So. So um, one of the things IFS is doing in this new cloud version that I was kind of happy with is um, they've included a lot of country localization. So they're trying to expand the product to be more global, which I think is great. So previously, if you went to another country, like we're looking at something, you know, maybe in Spain or Mexico, we would have to buy a localization and it was kind of a bolt on thing. Now it's in the core product where it's going to all these different markets are just built in. Um, there's a lot of AI and IoT functionality that's now built into the new cloud, and they're expanding that rapidly. And my understanding is the new version is going to have even more, and that's probably a whole separate conversation we could have, any. And um, they, they've well, also it's, heard... It's great, the whole, every vendor is going that way, so you know, IFS yeah. would be behind if they didn't. So, And they have some additional products that they've just taken on, um, such as Assist, which is a help desk system, but it's not just a, an IT help desk system, it's really an enterprise help desk system. So we we implemented that and maybe a good example is my purchasing asked me if we could use this help desk system for things like ordering 
pens and pencils of paper because apparently people run into their office every day long and say, can you order paper? Can you order pencils? And they decided, well, a help desk system would alleviate those interruptions. So it's really designed to be across the enterprise, HR, whatever, where people can go to one place and get help with whatever their problem is. And Hoka is a really interesting product too. We just implemented this like three weeks ago and it's proven to be hugely popular. And it's not really to do with the upgrade, but I'm gonna talk about it just for a second because I really think it's interesting. So they're calling it Facebook for the shop floor. And the purpose is to unite the shop floor and to bring a lot of this stuff to manufacturing levels that typically don't interface with the ERP system at all. Um, there's videos from micro learning for the employees. They can raise their rate and their ranks. Um, a lot of quality control stuff. There's automatic forms management, there's safety stuff, uh, maintenance. Uh, it's used for onboarding where the person can have all their training before they walk out in the shop floor in their language. So there's a lot to it. But I think for this purpose, for this discussion, it's really just pushing the ERP system down to a level where it's never been before. And I, I'm finding that quite exciting. I think it's a it's a really great thing. Oh, you know, if, if ERP was meant to be, you know, shop floor centric yes. it's become in most corporations it's become a finance tool and very removed from the blue collar and the warehouse world and so on and let me nuance that a little bit so when i say erp wasn't on the shop floor of course we have what we call the shop floor workbench where they can see their shop orders and, and report that they produce stuff or scrap or whatever have you but this is really getting them more involved um more feeling like they're part of the team. They have, you know, they can report stuff and look at stuff um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's also targeting the younger generation a bit because they're using, tick, you know, tools that they're very familiar with, you know, like a Facebook or a TikTok feed or whatever. Um, so it really is um, going to be something that we think will help us with the next generation of employees and keeping the shop floor staffed. So back, back to the upgrade. Um, Third-party vendors. That's your justification right there, being able to introduce that new application. <laughs> well, that would, yeah, it would be, except that I, we could have used that on our version 10. Sure. One of the things, the reason it wasn't, I should explain that, the reason Assist and POCA were on my, weren't on my integration slide with IFS is because neither one of them are yet tied in. They're both very new. IFS just recently acquired them. And I've already talked to the IFS people, and they're discussing in what ways we want to integrate them. So... Um, you know, setup stuff. Can the users be shared between them all? And can one system produce a work order in a different system? So those discussions are in the work, but at the moment they're uh, freestanding. So third-party vendors, uh, if you're running an upgrade and you have five or six like we do, or as you said, 60 or 70 third-party vendors, that is critically important. You really need to spend some time on that. You need to communicate your expectations, the deadlines, what you expect. I can tell you in the five major IFS upgrades we've done since we purchased it, there were only two where I had a problem in both cases, a 30-part vendor that assured me, yeah, 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 we're ready, we're ready, we're ready. And it wasn't done in time. And I had to go, you know, scream and yell and, and get them to move it along. So I, I kind of now have the attitude of, yeah, that's great. Show me. You know what I mean? We need to see it. Oh, we'll have it done in time. Yeah, well, okay, I need to I need to see it ahead of time. Um, now we'll get into my, my core upgrade philosophy of, you know, upgrades, you can take six months, you can take a year, you can take five years. And the upgrade will sort of expand to fill whatever time you have. And, you know, most people, they come into work and they want to do their job well, and then they want to go home. You know, they don't really want to take on a lot of extra stuff they don't need to take on. And my, what I found is that, you know, when you announce a new upgrade, people go in, they'll play with it for like two weeks. And in the middle, they'll not do much of anything. They have other stuff to do. And then when you say, hey, the upgrade is two weeks away, now they'll freak out and they'll start testing again. So I, I like to cut out a lot of time in the middle because it's not all that useful. Um, and you have to... I, you know, in writing, and I guess I said this before, I'm, I'm duplicating here, but you got to talk to the third party suppliers. And I, I've never believed that a longer upgrade is necessarily better. I think it gets stagnant and people get hung up in stuff. 
And I, I think it just gets harder and harder to keep it, you know, go. You need enough time, but I think too much time is also a problem. I think um, it's critically important to have a reasonable, realistic timeline and keep it as short as you can. And that kind of, kind of ties into my next philosophy. And this is a mistake, I, well, my opinion, a mistake that we see a lot. Um, we don't add any functionality during an upgrade unless it's necessary to the upgrade. So when you're selling this ERP system to your you know, executives, you're going to say, oh, it's going to do this better, and this is new, and this is new, and this is going to be exciting, and this is going to be great. And that's true, but we don't do those things during the upgrade. We wait until the upgrade is settled, and then we'll hit those things piece by piece and say, okay, now we're going to implement this. Now we're going to do that. And I've seen upgrades where the people doing the upgrade felt they had to do that so that the executives could see they kept their promises. But usually that ends up as kind of a mess because when you have problems, it can be hard to identify was the problem because of the upgrade or was the problem because of this new functionality. So my feeling is the simpler you keep it, the better. Then, you know, you have a limited no, amount of no, IT. I, yep. I look at a whole bunch of vendors, right? And I look at every kind of upgrade you can think about, right? And, you know, terms like greenfield, where you treat the new version as a greenfield opportunity, right? Let's use all the new functionality and all that. There's brownfield. There are so many new variations that customer, customers try. I think you're taking a very conservative, let's not push the functionality envelope, you know, make this a technical upgrade, which I think is a very safe way to do it. You know, when I was in Gartner, I wrote a paper called Upgrades Refueling in Midair. And I said, you know, make it as short as possible, plan it, you know, simulate it multiple times. You can afford to get it wrong, but keep it simple. So yeah, I like this approach. And uh, I think the other way to look at it is, you know, new function, it stretches your staff. You've got a limited number of people. And for the upgrade, even the technical upgrade, they're probably stretched to the maximum. So by doing it this way, now your staff, things have settled down. You still have the same number of people. Now they can focus on these improvements and probably do a better job of implementing than if they tried to do everything at the same time. So I think in the end, you're going to get a much better product and a much easier implementation. So I think one of the important points is that all new ERP systems have a more flexible architecture. And in a lot of cases, you can eliminate modifications. And I think it's really important to look for that. I mean, I, you know, I always look at modifications as the gift you keep on paying for. You know, you do a lot of it's got to be uplifted and yearly support and this, that, the other thing. And I'm finding with the new flexible architectures that a lot of that stuff can be gotten rid of. Now, we didn't have any F to begin with, but a lot of customers I talked to with a large number of modifications, when they really sat down and looked at it, were able to get rid of a lot of them by using um, IFS has things called custom fields and custom tables and custom logical units and things that really can help simplify the whole thing and anything built into those things is going to be vastly easier moving forward. Um, Alex, Alex um, the SAP world is clearly much more complex and I've been looking at automation in that world. It's gradual, but you, know, you custom code, what you're calling modifications, there's some amazing tools now available that basically do analysis and say, 30 to 40 percent, you can shelve this. You don't need to move this forward, right? And then they'll actually move the conversion over automated, right? So we're, we're making gradual progress on this. It's still I very, agree. Very, very manual in most companies, and the integrators love that, you know? Just of course they do. <laughs> Now, we, we did stretch this upgrade out a bit longer than we normally would have, but we did something that, that really worked out well for us, so I'm going to throw it out there. So there was a new user interface in the new version of IFS, and it was completely new. Um, it went from, you know, basically an app to uh, more of a cloud-based, runs in Chrome or, or Internet Explorer, and it was there was a lot of learning involved. So what we decided to do, of the well, I should say, this interface was also available towards the end in Apps 10. So what we did was we trained people and moved them over in the previous version of IFS 
so that when we did the technical upgrade on Thanksgiving, we were only dealing with the upgrade, not the trying to get everyone to use a new interface. So we were able to split the upgrade into those two pieces. And that that really helped a lot. That was a, a move that we worked out well. So that's um, pretty much my, my upgrade philosophy. And, uh, you know, thank you everyone for your time. Well, it sounds like you had a fairly clean, now, I think it took you what, from start to finish, what, seven, eight months? How long would you say? Say about eight months. You eight know, months. that included the, the actual beginning technical upgrade, the moving to the new interface and all of that training, and then the, the end technical upgrade. If, if it hadn't been for the user interface, I think we would have been looking at more like three months. Well, even seven or eight is not is not bad. I mean, it sounds like you invested a lot of time in um, the planning, the training, and so on. So, you know, these are things you could have back ended, but probably helped you to front end and all that. So, well, Alex, congratulations! You know, every upgrade that is successful deserves a pat. You, thank you, you very much, and thank you. You should toot your own horn. You know, no user is going to call you and say, Alex, thank you for a smooth upgrade, right? Just like they don't call you and say, hey, the system's very quick today. So <laughs> that's yeah, that's my line, Vinny. I think you stole it. But yeah, I, I always say I've never had a user in my IT career call me up and just say, hey, by the way, the system's really fast today. You know, this is great. It doesn't work that way. But that's OK. Well, that's where you make the big bucks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Vinny.